There it is right there. And I want to share this with you because this paragraph, it was, I was instructed to look at that shortly after I started to read the book, and it was the start of changing everything. Now, you can't read that from here, so we'll blow it up. Hill says there's a difference between wishing for a thing and being ready to receive it. No one is ready for a thing until they believe that they can acquire it. That's not an easy thing to do. He said the state of mind must be belief and not mere hope or wish. Now, the last two lines are critical. Open-mindedness is essential to belief. Closed minds will not inspire faith, courage, or belief. There's the key. You, if you want to be ready for the success that you dream about, that Blaine had you playing with mentally, physically, if you're ready, then you believe. And if you don't believe, you're not ready. It's that simple. Now, this is the sad truth. Most people, it's hope and wish. Got to hope this thing happens. If I go there, I wonder if it'll happen. You got to decide it's going to happen. It's got to be a decision you make. And it's got to be an irrevocable decision. It's not, it's not conditional on anything. This is exactly the way it's going to be done. You see, when you believe, everything else goes out the door. Now, how do you believe? Well, I talked about that earlier. Our belief system is based upon our evaluation of something. And frequently, if we reevaluate a situation, our belief about that situation will change. When Val said that to me, it was like bells going off in my head. I realized then how and why I had changed. I had been searching for nine and a half years. The change had taken place. My life had changed dramatically, but I had no idea why it had changed. People say, how would you do that? And I said, I'm, well, I don't know. I just do it. I have talked to all kinds of Olympians. I had a very good friend of mine, Mill Campbell, who's gone now, God bless him, but he was a gold medal decathlon winner. That means that on that day, he was the greatest athlete in the world. That's huge. And I remember him telling me, if he told me once, he told me a thousand times. He wanted down in Melbourne, at, at the Olympics in Melbourne. And, uh, and he, uh, he said that he and Rayford Johnson were running around the uh, area that they had built for the Olympians. And Rayford said to him, what do you think is going to happen, Milt? And Milt said, I told him, I said, Rayford, you've wasted your time coming here. This is mine. Now, Prior to that, that was in 1956. In 1952, he had gone to Helsinki. He watched Bob Matthias as a kid when he was 13. And he watched Matthias, who became a congressman out here at one time. Um, he went to London, and he became the greatest athlete in the world in 1948. And Milt saw that as a young boy. And he made up his mind... He was on the back of a Wheaties box that he was going to do that. At 13, he said, I am going to win the decathlon. His grandmother was raising him. He lived in Jersey. But he made up his mind he was going to win it. And four years later, he was in Helsinki. And he stood on the second step. Matthias wanted another gold. Matthias won the gold again. And Milt said, when I was standing on the second step, I made a commitment to myself. I was coming back in four years, and I was going to win the gold. Now, think of what he had to do. He had to train every day for the next four years. This is not lightweight stuff. And this is the real deal. I was running a meeting in... Where the hell was I? I was here. I had just got in my room. I hadn't even opened my bag. And the phone rang in my room. And I picked it up and it was Milt. 
And he, I said, you know, I started talking. He said, where are you? And I said, I'm in L.A. He said, I'm in L.A. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm here visit, visit with Bob Mathias. I said, really? I said, God, I'd love to meet him. And I said, why don't you bring him down? Why don't you come to lunch tomorrow? Bring him down. I'll have lunch with you guys. So he said, just a minute. He was gone from it. And he came back. He said, okay, Bob said he'd come. And so I was running a seminar for Prudential. This was quite a long time ago. Well, these two big guys come in. They sat down in the back of the room. And I knew who they were. I knew who Bill was. I didn't know who Bob was, but I knew who, I knew who was with him. And so um, they ducked out, and we had lunch, and we came back in. And uh, they said, yeah, you can go ahead. So I told a story. I told a story about a young guy who was 13 that saw another guy win a gold medal in the decathlon. And he made up his mind he was going to do that. Now, he was living with his grandma. He was in New Jersey. The temperature's not very nice in New Jersey, a good part of the year. And he said, he remember, he was upstairs, and he'd be saying, I am the greatest athlete in the world. And one day his grandma said, Milt, this may not be for us. He said, Grandma, we're not doing it. I'm doing it. Now, I want you to compare the difference. He went back, he went in 52 to Helsinki, and he won the silver. But he said, I'm going back in four years. He had to figure out how he could do it. He didn't have the money to hire a trainer. His family didn't have any money. So he got an idea. See, when you fall in love with the idea, the way will be shown. You've got to believe that. You can't wish. Wishing and hoping doesn't cut it. If you're going to be ready, you've got to believe it. You've really got to believe it. He got the idea. He went to the government. He said, I'll join the service if you send me to Southern California and you permit me to train. I'll run under your banner. They cut a deal. They sent him down here. He had great trainers. He was in favorable weather. And he did that for four years. They paid him while he was learning. He didn't have enough money otherwise. And he went and he won the gold. And then I told him, I said, now the other guy, Milt's black. Matthias was white. Matthias was raised in Southern California. His dad was a doctor. They had all kinds of money, comparatively speaking. He was hiring the best best trainers in the world. He could train all year long. Their situations were so far apart, they were almost polar opposites on the surface. But they both did the same thing because they both held the same image. And then I introduced them, and I brought well, the guys went nuts, the people in the audience. They did this. And I got them both to come up and talk about it. I've seen these things happen. I've worked with these people. I understand it. And I remember Milt was always saying, Milt had a key to my house. He's gone now, God bless him, but he had a key to my house. When he came to Toronto, he would just, it wouldn't matter if we were home or not, he could go and stay there. We were just great friends for a long, long time. But I remember he kept saying to me, he said, you know, I, I, I just, he, he, he couldn't get over this. He said, there was all kinds of guys in school that were better, better athletes than me, but they quit. <laughs> you say, you can't win if you quit. There is no quitting. It's got to be a commitment. And it's not going to be easy. Sandy's going to run you through here to something in a few minutes called the terror barrier. It gets to the point where you're damn good and scared. Yet it gets to the point where the outside starts to take control of the inside and you swear to God you're going to lose if you keep going. But you've got to keep going. 